Right, welcome back again. We're continuing solving absolute value equations, the second video for that. And where we're going to differ from the previous video is now you're going to have absolute value equations with variables on both sides, as you see in the goal here. It says you will use the algebraic definition of absolute value in order to solve absolute value equations with variables on both sides of the equation. Now what we need to start with this video then is reminding you of what the algebraic definition of absolute value is and that's what I've got in front of you right here. Remember that it depends on, the algebraic definition does, depends on whether the number you're taking the absolute value of is positive or zero or negative. Now if you're taking the absolute value of a positive number then the absolute value equals the number inside of the absolute value. If you're taking the absolute value of zero well, then the absolute zero, value of zero is always going to be zero. And if you're taking the absolute value of a negative number, well, the absolute value of a negative number is always going to be the opposite of that number. Quick examples, just to remind you from the previous video, if I have the absolute value of a positive number, I'm getting the same number as a result. All right, don't need to show you this one. And if I take the absolute value of a negative number, the resulting absolute value is the opposite of that number that I started with. All right, because we got to get a positive value every time we take an absolute value, right? So these two numbers were opposites. That's what that last thing means. Okay, let's apply this to solving equations now with variables on both sides. And so here's the situation I'm describing. We're going to see if we have a variable inside the absolute value bars and a variable on the other side of the equation. How do we find the solutions to that equation? Now, it turns out, we're going to have to consider two of these three cases up here whenever we're solving such an equation. Now a little side note here. In the last video when there was just a constant over here, I told you that you could already know whether there are two solutions or one solution or no solutions, but we don't know whether this quantity is positive or whether it's zero or whether it's negative because we don't know what the value of x is. So we're just going to assume at the beginning that we have a positive value over here, so to speak, okay? But we're going to assume that we don't know whether this quantity here is positive or negative. And so one way that we're going to have to go about solving this is we're going to have to assume that that quantity inside the absolute value bars is positive. That's one of the two cases that we're going to use here. And if we assume that, then our assumption is going to lead us to believe that the quantity inside the absolute value bars and the quantity on the other side are the same, right? If, the absolute value, if you're taking an absolute value of a positive number, you get the same thing that you started with. So if we take the absolute value and this is a positive quantity, then these two values have to be equal to one another. So we can say x plus b equals cx plus d. Remember I was doing case 1 and case 2 with some equations before, so this would be the first case. Now the second case that we've got to pay attention to attention to is we're going to pay attention to whether or not this value could actually be negative as well. And so we're going to assume that that value could be negative, that quantity inside the absolute value bars could be negative. And if it's negative, then we know that this value and this value are opposites of one another. And so that assumption leads us to this, that if this quantity ax plus b is negative, all right, if that quantity inside the absolute value is zero, that it is the opposite of what was on the other side, the opposite of Cx plus D. So this goes with that case right there. Great. So let's see how that works in practice. Actually, there's one more matter to attend to before we actually see how that works in practice. Whenever we're working with variables on both sides of the equation, we run into a situation where there are what are called extraneous solutions from time to time. And this is a definition that you need to know and that I'll describe for you here. And then when we look at examples, I will show you when we have a solution that's extraneous. And what an extraneous solution is, is this. It is an apparent solution to an equation that must be rejected because it does not satisfy the original equation. All right, an extraneous solution seems to be a solution, but it actually does not satisfy the original equation. Now you're going to see in this next example where a solution is going to be an extraneous, and you'll see why it's extraneous as well. 
let's go ahead and dive into this. And you dive in pretty deep with these kinds of problems to tell you the truth. Okay, so here's what we've been describing. We've got a, an absolute value equation with variables on both sides. And so we're going to have to consider two different cases in order to find our solutions. First, we're going to consider the case where this is a positive quantity in here, and it's equal to exactly what's on the other side of the equation. So you just write x minus 2 could be equal to 2x minus 5. But then we've got to consider the other case as well, where this quantity here, x minus 2, is negative, which would make it the opposite of this value right here. And so we would write that equation this way. We'd say x minus 2 equals, and then we're just going to put the other side in parentheses and put a negative sign in front of it. x minus 2 equals the opposite of 2x minus 5. All right, so we got our assumption for when this quantity is positive here and when this quantity is negative over here. Now we're going to need to solve both of those equations, of course. Let's go ahead and collect our variable terms on both sides. I'm going to do two steps at once here. Let's go ahead and subtract 2x from both sides, and x minus 2x will give us negative x. And at the same time, let's move our constants to the right side of the equation. We have to add 2 to make that happen, and negative 5 plus 2 is going to be negative 3, right? And then we have to divide both sides by negative 1 to finish getting x by itself. So x equals 3 is apparently a solution. And because we're thinking about extraneous solutions, that's why I want to say this is apparently a solution. We'll see if it really is in a moment. All right, now for the other case, we need to simplify the right side of the equation first using the distributive property. So let's make this x minus 2 is equal to negative 2x plus 5. And then I'll bring my constants, my variables to the left and my constants to the right again. Let's add 2x to cancel out the negative 2x. x plus 2x is going to give you 3x's over here. And then if I add 2 to both sides, I'll have a 5 plus 2 is 7. And I get x is equal to 7 thirds. Now this next thing that I'm going to write is imperative when there are variables on both sides of the equation. You absolutely have to take these apparent solutions that we got from following the methods that you need to follow in order to solve absolute value equations, we need to see if those apparent solutions actually work in the original equation. So you have to substitute answers into orig the original equation, both of them. So let's start with this one right here, x equals 3. And so I'm just going to put parentheses where both of the x's were and make my substitutions in the original equation again must be the original equation. Let me underline that. So we could say the absolute value of 3 minus 2 equals 2 times 2 minus 5, or excuse me, not 2 times 2 minus 5. We got 3 for x, so let me put a 3 right there, right? And that'll give us the absolute value of 1 is equal to 6 minus 5, or in other words, the absolute value of 1 is equal to 1. Now that's a true statement. And because we plugged this number in and it actually made the original equation true, that means that 3 really is a solution to this equation, which I will label up here that is a solution. Now what we need to do is we need to plug 7 thirds, our other apparent solution, into the equation and see if it's actually a solution or not to that original equation. All right, so we're plugging in 7 thirds here, the absolute value of 7 thirds minus 2 is equal to 2 times 7 thirds minus 5. Now let's do some simplification. Here we're going to have to do some subtraction with fractions, and so it would be nice if this was a fraction with the same denominator, and that's easy enough to happen. I could rewrite 2 as 6 thirds, so let's make that 7 thirds minus 6 thirds. Here, let's go ahead and multiply 2 times 7 thirds, and that's 14 thirds. And then we would like since we're going to be subtracting with a fraction, to have this written as a fraction with a denominator 3 as well. 5 is the same as 15 thirds. So that's the expression that we're going to get there. And then we'll get the absolute value of 7 thirds minus 6 thirds. Well, that's 1 third. And then, well, we might put a slash for that in a moment. In fact, we're going to. Because on the right side, we're going to get 14 thirds minus 15 thirds, which is negative 1 thirds. And it's impossible for the absolute value of any number to be negative, right? So that's actually false. And because when we plugged in 7 thirds into the original equation, it gave us an untrue statement, 
That means this is not actually a solution as it appeared. This is an extraneous solution. And so I've labeled it as such. Now it needs to be clear on your paper whether you're saying each of these values is a solution or it's extraneous, okay? Because a lot of people think these numbers down here are the solutions or this is the extraneous solution. They would say one third is, but it was seven thirds that was extraneous, three that was a solution. And if you don't label that, I'm not going to assume that you've got it correct. Capiche? All right, we're going to try one more of these because the process is going to be the same every time whenever you have variables on both sides. And you see the equation we're working with. What I would like to do is consider our two cases here. Again, with the first case being that we're assuming that 4 plus 3x is a positive quantity, and thus it is equal to exactly what's on the other side of the equation. So we're going to first assume that 4 plus 3x is equal to 6 minus x. And then we'll consider the other case where this is a negative quantity here, and so it absolute value is going to be the opposite of it. In other words, we're going to assume that 4 plus 3x is the opposite of 6 minus x, like so. Remember, just put that entire expression in parentheses and put a negative sign in front of it. That's how you make it the opposite of. Now, let's solve both of those equations. Let's go on to case 1, and let's get the variables on the left side. Why not? So let's add x to both sides. 3x plus x will give us 4x. And at the same time, we might as well go ahead and cancel out the constants from the left side by subtracting 4. 6 minus 4 is going to give you 2. And then 2 fourths would be the value of x. In simplest form, that would then be 1 half. All right, so here's an apparent solution. You know at this point that we're going to have to plug that back into the original equation momentarily to make sure it actually is a solution. Now with the second case. 4 plus 3x equals the opposite of 6 minus x. Well, let's go ahead and simplify the right side of the equation before we isolate the variable by distributing the negative sign. That'll give us negative 6 plus x. Then subtract x from both sides. 3x minus x is 2x. Subtract 4 from both sides. Negative 6 minus 4 is negative 10. So we'll get x equals negative 5. Now, a little hypothesizing time. In the last example where we had variables on both sides, we had one solution that actually worked and one solution that was extraneous, correct? And you might recall that the extraneous solution happened to be the fractional value that we got. All right. So does that mean that every time you get a fraction for an answer, you get an extraneous value? Well, there's no way to know but to actually check it out. So let's check our solutions. And remember, when you're checking to see if one half is a solution, plug it into the original equation like this. That would be the absolute value of 4 plus 3 times x, so 3 times 1 half, equals 6 minus 1 half. Okay, now simplifying the left side, you know that 3 times 1 half hopefully is 3 halves, and let's go ahead and turn this 4 into an 8 halves so that we can combine those two expressions on the next step. And then here, let's make the 6 into a 12 halves so that we can do that subtraction. And so we're going to get the absolute value of 11 halves equals 11 halves. Well, that's a true statement, isn't it? So this x equals 1 half actually is one of our solutions, or actually is a solution. When I say one of our solutions, we don't know if it's the only one or not, but we definitely know it is one now. And again, make sure when you find out it is a solution that you label it as a solution. I'll look for that every time when there's variables on both sides. Now let's check for when x equals negative 5. All right, so you see I've plugged in negative 5 both here, uh, sorry, in the original equation, both here and there. And so here that's going to give me 4 minus 15, the absolute value of 4 minus 15. And here that's going to give me 6 plus 5 which you could have just done all that in one step actually and gotten to the absolute value of negative 11 is equal to 11. Well, that's true as well, isn't it? So it turned out in this case, for this equation, I mean, that both of the apparent solutions really were solutions. You saw in the previous example, they don't have to be. There were no extraneous solutions here. Labeled them both as solutions. All right, so when you have variables on both sides of the equation, 
we're going to always use two cases when we're solving. We're going to use a case where we assume this quantity here is positive and thus equal to what's on the other side. And we're going to use a case where we assume this quantity is negative and thus the opposite of what's on the other side. And then when you get solutions to each of those new equations, plug them back into the original equation to see if you actually got true solutions or solutions that are extraneous. That's your charge. Thanks for watching. I know it's difficult. Understandable though, right? And you can do it. Thanks. I'll see you later.